obviously not. Um, if so, how can the aphorism be ex uh, extant today? How could they continue to be fulfilling for Muslims with all the questions, queries of the age without engaging in ta'wil? Well, um, again, you know, we'll be polite about that because um, in my case, um, do you have a question? No. In my case, um, one of the people that I love more than anybody after the Prophet وسلم, after Abu Bakr and Umar and Uthman and Ali is Shaykh Abdul Qadir Jilani. This happens to be my personal preference. And he is an Athari. He is a Salafi. You know, and but he knows what he is saying. You know, and I believe that he would be quite capable of explaining everything to everybody. So he takes this in and he holds it like that. And in my belief, Shaykh Abdul Qadir Jilani and even Abi Zayd al Qayrawani and Al Tahawi, and there are many others. They take that position and it is Salim. You know, but also in the case of Shaykh Abdul Qadir, he is an Arif Billah. He is a great knower of God. And therefore he knows what he's saying when he talks about these things. So I don't see any inadequacy in that path at all. <clears throat> but again, we do not interpret in that path. And we do not take things literally. But we understand that these are jewels and that they radiate light, and we let them radiate that light. Um, however, you know, when we talk about the challenges of the age, and we talk about modern physics and <laughs> astronomy and biology and bioethics and a lot of other things mm -hmm. like genetic manipulation of DNA, which is a horror. <coughs> it, is, it is genetic roulette. And all American, our American scientists were very clear about that. You open up the door to Monsanto to, to patent a type of wheat, you know, and to change the DNA. And even in the United States, whether you believe it or not, they take tomatoes and cross them with the DNA of pigs so that they have longer shelf life. I don't want to eat that tomato. I don't say it's haram. You know, but like, what are you doing? You know, you have the Sunnah of Allah, and you have the Sunnah of the Messenger of Allah, and in reality, you don't tamper with the Sunnah of Allah unless you have permission through the Sunnah of Rasulullah, وسلم, which is the Sharia. This is really dangerous. This genetic modification of plants and other things, animals as well, is is genetic roulette. And we have sicknesses today. And this is what the American government was warned about. That what we know about genetic modification is that it produces sicknesses and other things. We don't know where this begins and we don't know where it ends. You know, uh, it's a very dangerous thing. But we have to be able to talk about these things today. And we need to be able to talk about them intelligently. Uh, one of the things that we want to do in the United States, especially a man that I work with, uh, Maulana al Hafid Amin, who is a great scholar in our time, is to be able to talk intelligently about bioethics. He can do that. But we have to do that. Muslims have to be there. The Jews are there. The Christians are there. They talk about this with great sophistication. And a lot of Muslims who go there, you're embarrassed that they even showed up. They didn't even know what they're talking about. You know, so we have to be able to talk about these things with great <coughs> sophistication. And therefore, we need to be able to draw on our whole tradition. Is that okay, or do you have something else? I'm just wondering, more about it. would you say that there are still atharis today? Um, what it, are you getting at? Same, no, 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 no <laughs> I mean that with all respect, but has that tradition survived mm -hmm. in the same way that the uh, Asha'ira mm -hmm. and the Bible have survived? Like, is it transmitted by yes. Ibn? What does Musa Ferber say? <laughs> so the atharis tradition is Imam Safarin. Okay, so I don't know the answer to that question, but I would believe that it is still alive. You know, and, and that's just my confidence, but I don't know where to look for it. I don't know who's the one who transmits it. Um, or is it 
the case that contemporary authorities are not really authorities but are simply trying to associate themselves with that for uh, authenticity's sake. So do we have to answer that question? <coughs> Hasn't. Do we have to answer that question? <laughs> uh, in any case, yes? Sorry, what, what, what's Afrin? What he's trying to say is Salafi. Okay. Boom. <laughs> <laughs> that's what he's trying to say. You know? And um, that's what we're being polite about. And again, because um, I don't like to call names. And, um, you know, I don't want to make anybody unhappy. But, um, and, you know, we live in a time of great difficulty and great misunderstanding. So the best thing that we can do is to be brothers and sisters. And the best thing that we can do is to talk with each other and to discuss and to try to come to an understanding of truth. Okay, I want to follow the Quran and the Sunnah. I don't want to do anything else. And my brother and sister also want to do that. So let's talk about that. And let's talk about our tradition, Imam Malik, Imam Abu Hanifa, Shafi'i, Ahmed bin Hanbal, uh, Al Ash'ari, Al Maturidi, Al Junaid Al Salih. And let's try to talk about it in an objective, honest way, with no excitement, you know, no emotion. And um, may Allah make that possible for us because. We can't be divided, we can't be fighting each other, we cannot be uh, ripping ourselves apart. You know, this is not good. This is not our tradition. And nevertheless, um, I had a great sheikh, and um, he, his name was Sheikh Muhammad Mahmoud bin Zidan. May Allah have mercy mm -hmm. on him. Uh, he was a Mauritanian, and he lived in Medina. I knew him for many years. And uh, he's one of the greatest people I knew in my life. And um, he was a very honest man, and he was a great scholar. And I would go visit him regularly. Um, I would even give him part of my salary every month. I didn't, you know, I, Allah gave me more than I needed, so I could give him a certain amount every month. He was very poor. And at the end of his life, I came to Medina. He was in Medina. I gave him something. He said, after this, don't give me anything more. He said, I don't need it. Thank you so much. You know, I don't need it anymore. So I thought, you know, mashallah, maybe somebody now is helping him. He's got everything he needs. And then a few weeks later, he passed away. And he was sitting in the rolda, which he would always do. And he died sitting in the rolda. And then when the ziyara of the Nisa came, the visit of the wizard women, the police came and said, Ya Sheikh, Qum, Ya Sheikh, Qum. <coughs> and he's just sitting there. And then they go up, Ya Sheikh, Qum. And then they found out that he's not alive. He's just sitting there. And he was a beautiful human being. And he was a Sunni of Ahlul Sunni al Jama'ah, but he hated no one. And in Medina, all the people that were in Medina, to my knowledge, they all knew him and they respected him. And that's why they left him. Nobody, no, he, he didn't, he, he was very beautiful in everything he said. But if you came to him, he would tell you the truth, whether you liked it or not. And during the Gulf War, um, I spent most of the Gulf War in Medina with him because, you know, our, I was a teacher and the professor, I was a professor in the university. I taught uh, Islamic studies and comparative religion. And in the Gulf War, the school was closed, you know, because people were afraid that there would be a bomb attack or something like that. So I went to Medina to be with him. And I'll tell you what he told me. So one of the things he said is, beware of the makers of claims. And he said that if you say you are a follower of Imam Malik or Abu Hanifa, or the Shafi'i, or Ahmed ibn Hanbal, you are safe. Because these are valid interpretations. Many Muslims today don't understand that. Uh, I've just written a book called Malik and Medina, Islamic Legal Reasoning in the Formative Period. Uh, it will be published by Brill, which is a good publisher. 
it's an academic book, inshallah it will be out in March. And um, if you can read it, it, you have to take a mortgage to buy it. <laughs> it's, it's by grill, you know. I mean, I don't get a penny. They're Dutch. They're Dutch, you know. But they they charge an arm and a leg, okay? But I went with Brill because they're the best academic publisher in our field. And I want the book to be read, I want it to be studied. So that's an honor for me to have Brill publish it. But this book is a study of why we have these different schools, what they are historically, and um, why Islamic law develops that way in the first 300 years. So if you're able to read this book, and it will be available on PDF, you know, then you could try to do that. I try to write it very simply. It's an academic book, so it has to have all the academic apparatus and footnotes and things <coughs> like that. And please don't be scared by that. I tried to write it in the simplest way that I could. But this is a very important thing. These imams in the Sunni tradition, you know, in the Sunni tradition, the definition of a Sunni is a person who in fiqh follows Abu Hanifa, Malik, Ash-Shabi, or Ahmed ibn Hanbal, and who in Aqidah follows Al-Ash'ari or Maturidi, or the valid Athari tradition, and who in Ihsan follows the way of al junaid al -Sabi. This is the way that we have defined ourselves for almost a thousand years. So that's not something new, even though today it is startling information for many people. And I don't blame them for that at all. And I don't say that they have no understanding, no. This is the reality of the time that we have. But it's very important for us, I believe, to understand the treasure of the past. This is the way he was. He was a Sunni. And he taught me many things, especially the Maliki school. And he taught me the Aqidah and other things like that. He was a great man. And uh, so in the Gulf War, we were all, uh, you know, uh, affected by the Gulf War in a way that you can, maybe cannot imagine because many of you are very young. You maybe were not even born at that time. But the Gulf War, I mean, like, this was a horrible thing. This was a horrible event. We saw the occupation of the Hijaz. I saw the airplanes coming in one minute after another. That's not happy. That's not, the whole, the Hajj airport was nothing but bombers. You know, the airport itself was empty of anything but military personnel. This is not good. You know, so he said that if you say before Allah that I followed Abu Hanifa, or I followed Malik, or I followed Shafi'i, or I followed Ahmed al Hanbal. And really, these schools are rich and incredible. And the Hanbali school is among the greatest of all the schools. That I believe unequivocally. Okay, then he said, You're safe. You know, you will be safe. But he said, If you say you're a Salafi, and again, anyone who's here who is a Salafi, you know, I don't mean to offend you in any way, and I have nothing against you whatsoever. But he said, if you say you're a Salafi, that is a huge claim. Because then you're saying, I am like Abu Bakr. I am like Omar. I am like Uthman. I am like Ali. And he said, God will test you. And he will test you with a test worthy of the Salaf. If you tell me that you studied nuclear physics, and I want to employ you, right? I will test you to see if you know nuclear physics. Isn't that true? <coughs> so he said, they, and he said, this is their test. He said, this is their test. And he said, they failed utterly. I mean, the, the trouble that came after that, you know a lot about that. I mean, it hurts my heart <coughs> to even think about it. And again, we ask Allah to bring this ummah back to where it ought to be. And all of our brothers and sisters who want to follow the Salaf, you know, Allah bless them. Allah have mercy upon them. I want to follow the Salaf too. We want to all be like that. So we ask Allah to enable us to bring the Ummah back together. This is a time when we need to be able to unite 
and not to divide. But we have to unite, not on the basis of slogans, and not on the basis of politics, you know, but on the basis of understanding of the religion. And one of the greatest things about Islam is that it is a religion of toleration. Where do we agree in Islam? We agree on the qat'iyat. We agree on the muhkamat. And in the mutashabihat and in the dhaniyat, you have to have ijtihad. Okay? And we tolerate each other in that. Imam Malik loved Abu Hanifa. You know, Imam Malik, after Abu Hanifa died, he would receive Hamad ibn Abi Hanifa. And they would talk about his father and about his fiqh and so forth. Okay, so this is our tradition. You know, may Allah name.